I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today I continue with section 410 of the Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. We'll be working on book three, Space and Man, the urban effect as the genesis of the divine. Synopsis. For three or four thousand millions of years, life has been nipping away at the earth, constructing for itself ever more miraculous abodes. Complexity is explosively affirming its own power to synthesize spirit. The urban effect presides over the process of interiorization and sensitization. This genesis of the divine is the tidal wave we are part of and partaker in. In the last few years, religious movements and new churches have been sprouting with fresh vigor in many countries. Perhaps this is an indication that when a society loses its ethical moorings or its sense of grace, a counterbalancing stress develops within it. Unfortunately, there is a great deal of arbitrariness and conceptual poverty in this reaction. The mediocrity of the remedy seems to reflect the mediocrity of the patient. The difficulty is intrinsic to a reaction which has not internalized the dimensions of the problem. We are shortchanging ourselves. It is in view of this that I find myself compelled to propose an eschatological model which has one necessary premise. The preeminent nature of the divine is complexity. Without the presence of complexity, there is no possibility of grace in its totality or in its inclusiveness of all and everything. Once one is willing to perceive God, real or hypothetical, present or future, as the epitome of complexity, as an infinitude of consciousness, copresence, relatedness, knowing, understanding, love, and integrity, then one is compelled to look for the divine apart from those conditions which are inimical to the incapable of such infinitude. The summation of those conditions is to be found in the categories of mass, energy, space, and time. To be made of any of them limits wholeness and might touch upon the absurd. To be made of them is to be defined according to the grid of space of time, to be fragmented by the granularity of our mass energy. Divinity in its totality has to be independent of mass energy, independent of space time. And by independent is meant not a condition of reciprocal exclusion, but a condition of consummation of one into the other. If it were a condition of exclusion, there would be the divine and in parallel with it, that which has been excluded. In this theological model, mass, energy, space, and time consume themselves in the process of authoring and nurturing the development of the divine. In the condition of non-total consummation, there is a lack in the perfection of divinity. If one or more components of a chemical compound is left out, the process is incomplete. In such case, there is a perfectible divinity, capable of completing the process by consuming the remainder, perfecting itself into the absolute. What is this consummation? Perhaps there are no alternatives to the nature of consummation. The consummation of mass, energy, space, and time have to be, per force, neither out of nor away from but into the entelechy of all. Only in the totally internalizing sweep is the divine achieved, ultimate in totalizing. Ultimate, indeed, since a primeval condition, absolute and total, entails the involution of a clean sweep into the original world of mass, energy, space, and time. Think of a TV commercial where, by the reverse action trick, a polished floor is unswept dirty. This sets the following model. A process of becoming is the consumption of the mass-energy universe through the space-time parameter under the pressure of complexification. The pressure of complexification has its origin in the imperative of survival. In fact, in the imperative of survival and the imperative of transcendence, the true function of survival, of mass, energy, space, and time. Because of this pressure, the becoming is not arbitrary and entropic, but is self-disciplined and asyntropic, made of progressively more forceful tendencies, that disincarnation which is the stuff of evolution, of the present into the next present, each yielding the activation of more mass, energy, space, and time into conscience, duration, and spirit. If there is a point of arrival where such a process has consumed what one might call the media, mass, energy, space, and time, into what one might call the message of the spirit logos, that is to say, the point where the process of becoming evolution reaches the condition of being ultimate and therefore massless, energyless, spaceless, timeless, then it might be appropriate, if not necessary, to hypothesize an original primeval condition, self-same, and also deprived of mass, energy, space, and time, a condition of original being, a negation of non-being. 
There's therefore in this model a primeval being preceding mass, energy, space, and time, and an ultimate being, which is the consummation of mass, energy, space, and time. The alpha being and the omega being are separated by the process of becoming. Two beings, one the offspring of the other, yet utterly estranged from one another. The alpha being the father, negating non-being, empty of significance and full of the potential granules of mass, energy, space, and time, in utterly brutish media on the verge of becoming. The omega being, the sun, significant and radiant, the crucible which exhausts the media in the escalatory process evolution of creating itself, the ultimate message. In its absoluteness, being can neither recognize nor stand otherness. Therefore, there is no way for one being to be co-active and co-present with another being. Once the alpha being has burst into becoming, becoming is all there is until the consummation of itself, total and absolute, into a new being, the omega being. The inherent impossibility of the first being touching upon the last being and in so doing, acknowledging otherness and partaking of it, is also the inherent nature of creation, the mystery of that which is not yet in that which will originate it. The primeval being is lost to becoming. The ultimate being caused by becoming is not yet. Therefore, anguish is intrinsic to the process and the double aspect of incompleteness, becoming, and of unknowability, the mystery of the future which is not yet. Such anguish is also the primer which keeps evolution progressing, transcending step after transcending step from one now into the next, on and on, in pursuit of the ultimate. The thesis is that the process which will eventually dissolve the mystery and abate the anguish is the urban effect. Fundamentally, it is that original phenomenon in which two or more particles of physical matter begin to interact in ways other than the statistical and fatal, the laws of physics. That is to say, in ways which are organic or living and eventually instinctive, conscious, self-conscious, mental, cultural, and spiritual. The urban effect is the progressive interiorization, urbanization of the mass energy universe, initially deploying itself in space-time and eventually recollecting itself through the transfigurative process of evolution into spirit. The urban effect, in the fullness of its transfigurative action, makes visible and active all those forces and categories which characterize the living and the loving. Interdependence, interaction, perception, learning, care, cooperation, altruism, feedback, synergy, compassion, transcendence, beauty, integrity, intensity, passion, trust. At the very beginning, when life is only a very dim manifestation of consciousness, the urban effect is embryonic and skeletal, and yet astonishing if compared with its physical counterpart, the random-like existence of the mass energy mode. The initial act of the urban effect is the breaking of being into becoming, the first acknowledgement of otherness. It originates the space-time coordinates necessary to unravel the mass energy latent in the alpha being. The final act is the urban effect, at last exhausting space-time and the transcendence of the last mass energy particle, completing therefore the denouement becoming into the omega being. As night follows day, resurrection follows the vanishing of mass, energy, space, and time. The vanishing is total, as postulated in all the events of all places and all times are, they have become coexistent, coactive, co-conscious, and coordinated. This occurrence secures the totality of the Omega Being, since in its utter complexity is contained and integrated all that had once been becoming, mass, energy, space, and time, in its ultimate of total knowing, total presence, total experience, total love. The Omega Being is the totally miniaturized offspring of becoming, because it is the massless, energyless, spaceless, and timeless ultimate. Therefore, the urban effect operates as the escalatory disincarnation of mass, energy, space, and time into the divine, if and when wedded to the escalatory intensification of complexity and miniaturization. In fact, the urban effect, the making of the divine, is a true process of complexification and miniaturization, for the simple reason that elementalism and dispersion are ontologically foreign to the nature of the divine. In the presence of elementalism and dispersion and perforce their inertia, coaction, interaction, cooperation, knowledge, and love are impeded, limited, and curtailed from their ultimate fullness. They are the media getting in the way, in the sense of being as yet unusable, of the totalized, all-inclusive message. The infinitude of the divine, the Omega God, is postulated on the reduction to naught of both space and time, the devices through which mass energy media cry out for the spirit, which is slowly and painstakingly being generated within its own folds, Mother Nature, and in generation is consummation, the son consuming the mother, making himself out of her. There is an eschatological imperative shrouded within the urban effect. If, by the nature of the divine, the urban effect is submitted to the complexity miniaturization necessity, then our urban undertakings, an infinitesimal part of the urban effect present in the universe, are clearly ordained by the methodology which informs the eschatological process. They have to sustain and function 
clearly and uncompromisingly, for and within the complexity miniaturization paradigm. By so doing, spirit extrudes itself from matter and by the consumption of it, disincarnation, arcology, and the second generation arcology, the two sons arcology, by intent and design, try to be congruent with this paradigm. One could then summarize by outlining the what, the why, the how, and the urban effect. What? One. Alpha being is a negation of non-being. Two. The alpha being shattered by becoming at the onset of mass, energy, space, and time. Three. Becoming disincarnated, consumption of mass, energy, space, and time into Omega being. Logos. Logos, Omega God, is the resurrectional advent of all becoming. Why? The alpha being of total elementalism and brutishness longs for anotherness, total integrity and grace. The becoming is the bridge between alpha being the father and omega being the son. The incompleteness of the becoming and the unknowability of its ultimate metamorphosis logos are the causes for life's anguish. How? The loss of being into becoming triggers the process of complexification miniaturization, which step by step sees mass, energy, space, and time becoming spirit up to the final step, leap, when by the total and final consumption of the media, the omega being, the message comes to be. The urban effect. The process of complexification miniaturization is the urban effect, the durational process, which will eventually precipitate mass, energy, space, time into the massless, energyless, timeless, Spacelessness of Omega, the resurrectional condition of being. That concludes the urban effect as the genesis of the divine. Moving on. Mass transit, mass delusion. Synopsis. The flat grid of our cities in the urban effect are irreconcilable. Where one is, the other cannot be. The flat grid is the unspoken and unspeakable indictment of the flesh, the fracture of the bridge channeling matter into spirit. Ultimately, it consigns consciousness to the proto-consciousness of a computerized will. What would a blood corpuscle say, or do, if his longings and his compulsions were divided between a lung 15,000 yards away and a kidney 18,000 yards away? Would his choice make any difference? The poor corpuscle would never make it to either organ, nor could it respond to dozens of other institutions wanting and begging it to join them. Many of our corpuscles never make it either. Our corpuscles are ourselves in those inherent rights that a civilization dutifully makes available to its members. Successful or not in the pursuit of these rights, the masses are highly transient. The delusion, massive and stubborn by the billions of dollars, is inherent in any topological layout, which makes distance the number one obstacle to participation, affiliation, service, help, or information. This topography, the flat topography, fosters the delusion that that which cannot be achieved by shortness and swiftness can be achieved by energy and velocity. That is what kills the corpuscle. In order to succeed, it would have to be many times as powerful person in an automobile as an individual corpuscle person, and many times faster person in an automobile. Even more paradoxical is that if the corpuscles were faster and more powerful, the body they would travel in the city would necessarily axiomatically be destroyed by the savage machines for singles or groups which made them so. The size of the nuisance and the arrogance of such insane misbehaving corpuscles, that is to say, the scale of the imposition upon the body and the scale of the body, the city, are incompatible. No matter what medium, single carrier or mass carrier, is interposed between the corpuscle and the organ, between the persona and the institution, the disproportion remains such that one is always the nemesis of the other. It is a disproportion which ingrains itself into the makeup of both the personal and the collective soul of the city. Mass transit is only a delusion of lesser magnitude than the delusion of the personal carrier. It is cheaper, though it does not pay for itself, less energy consuming, less preposterous. It still does not face the facts. The facts are that we deal with a finite world, a finite personal lifespan, a finite energy endowment for each individual, a finite intelligence, a finite patience, a finite capacity for sufferance, a finite solvency. All those finitudes are under the umbrella, or in, is it the iron fist, of the mass energy gravitational rules. It might be quasi-sane to ask what in the hell we think we're doing. We are furiously destroying life, while shouting with the wind left to us by frustration and pollution, I am free, I am free at last. I know what the reaction will be. Who the hell does he think he is telling everyone what fools they are? For one thing, history has repeatedly proven that it is often the reasoning of one confronting the reasoning of many that is the key to better answers. Additionally, and more importantly, the assumption that the many are the great majority... That everyone is on the other side of the fence is untrue. The opposite is true on two counts. One, of all man's present and past, only a small minority belongs body and soul to the Los Angeles syndrome. Two, 
Of all of animal life, none, not one animal organism or association of organisms in extra biological structures, beehives, anthills, etc., belongs to the Los Angeles syndrome. Only a small minority of human beings, a puny minority of non vegetal life, is Los Angeles oriented. Then the transient masses given to the ethos of gigantism are relatively small. The mass delusion is a minority delusion. What this says is that, quite possibly, I am speaking for the relative as well as the absolute majority. The problem is that I am addressing myself to a minority which happens to see things differently. Why the ethos of gigantism? It is the ethos exemplified in the analogy of the beginning of this paper, the corpuscles having to equip themselves with an engine bigger than themselves in order to pursue distant goals. But the nemesis of gigantism is that it is self-escalatory. The bigger combined person plus mechanism demands more space, 50 to 60 percent of the Earth's city surface. Thus, the system is expanded. The expansion of the system foments the enlargement and multiplication of the combine. Then, the never ending series of cycles of expansion is seeded genetically in the gigantic body to become its ethos. A fight over Los Angeles will show what I mean. All of them, even the little towns, are gigantic spreads of square miles upon square miles of repetitive encasements of people. Since every one of those people had and has only a small part to play in the encasement, and since habit makes for acquiescence, those people, us, tend to be believe that such non-dogmatic encasement is freedom. To suggest that the dogma is the negation of freedom is tantamount to apostasy. We are, or seem, determined to embrace the dogmatism of the two-dimensional grid. And since at this point we are where we are forced to be, different options do not exist, an even stronger argument is made for the contention that one must be practical, meaning that even though we might be dead wrong, the best thing we can do is make wrongness even better, wronger. The plain truth might be the unwillingness to really feel the massiveness of the problem, its intrusion into all facets of life and the rejection of the responsibility for both atonement and redemptive action. If one divorces oneself from responsibility for a certain situation, one finds a thousand excuses not to feel guilt or to do anything about it. Our actions either reveal reverence for life and ourselves within it, or they do not. The bully, the sophist, the opportunist, and the hypocrite are, in the final analysis, powerless to score anything of importance for the human condition. Believe it or not, this is where the bulk of the debate of mass transit versus single movers shows itself for what it is, an exercise in futility. Both solutions reveal an absence of perception of the reverential nature, in fact, the theological nature of a true resolution. This reverential vacuum is the scourge of practical man, and it is what causes him to be eternally late for his appointment with destiny. The pessimism expressed here is not toward our capacity to develop into better selves. It's a negative view of the trust we put in the practical turn of mind, since I firmly believe that behind practicality most often lurks the unreality of renunciation, copping out, as the saying goes. Nothing makes copping out sweeter than self-engendered righteousness, belonging to the well-adjusted, responsible, proven majority of a minority. A cursory look at history and prehistory does quick justice to such a prejudice. The well-adjusted majority has two nemeses. 1. Fossilization in the matrix encasing each expression of each of its members, and 2. Death at the hand of physical, biological, or mental adversaries or an alliance of them. What is the rationale demanding a theological framework for a logistical problem? Quite simply, the inextricable compressence of a formation understanding response with life itself. Where one is absent, the other is illusory. But the capacity for perception of information understanding response is based ultimately on the logistical carriers the system can utilize, psychological, mental, social, cultural, or physical, or any mix of them. Cut the flow and you cut life. Strangle the flow and you strangle the consciousness of the imminent. Taking the city as one of the many and most recent manifestations of the highly cooperative nature of living stuff, one can then name the first city, that cooperative or community where more than two particles of matter become interdependently locked and synergistically responsive to one another. The locking and responsiveness established the import and nature of the logistics of consciousness, the form that would make possible the function consciousness which would appear eons later. Given the decision center, the brain which develops from a prototypical invention, the nerve fiber throughout evolution, the problem has been how to get the information there swiftly and undistorted, and then how to get the response out swiftly measured and pertinent. Nowhere was speed or bulkiness part of the scene. They could not be since their nature is brutally inimical to the delicate balance of the unfolding event. 
The city has evolved into myriads of miraculous organisms, each successfully winning this logistical battle through swiftness and measure in the crescendo of complexity, which no mechanical instrument, computer included, can match. Now the latecomer, one split thousandth of the last second of the last minute of the last hour of the 24-hour crescendo of life, the Los Angeles Syndrome, negates all those things, saying, I'll show you the way, the better way, the true way, the rubber wheel way. The true delusion of grandeur, where the gigantic is seen as the grand design of the human intellect, a flat human intellect, as the case demonstrates well. Any realist who has even a purely cursory acquaintance with the laws of thermodynamics and their equation of energy input can instantly diagnose the pathology of gigantism. Waste. Since for the city the essential parameter is life, such waste, expressed directly and brutally life's waste, given a giant as any small or big Los Angeles is, gigantic instruments are necessary to keep some spark of life in the flat body. Gigantic instruments are exactly what life has been successfully avoided throughout its evolution. Smallness and discreteness have been the characteristics of the instruments selectively constructed by the living stuff. In the inorganic field, the gigantic and the small, proportioned to their respective performances, are exemplified by the automobile and its kingdom, the elevator and its shaft. Within the cityscape, one goes for destruction and absurdity, the other goes for the swift and the proper. There is no black magic in this, simply the magic, in the case of the elevator, of the well-measured response to a certain need. The automobile signifies the bloated, irrational, self-defeating trend toward a human condition, which translates into physical terms as the entropic quiescence to inertia, an inertia paradoxically pursued through the consumption of physical energy, gasoline included, and human energy, at a synergy threshold less than zero. It goes without saying that the replacement for the car is not so much the elevator as it is our own legs. Since the rewards, the ends, for such consumption, consumerism, are becoming smaller and smaller, and since it cannot be otherwise, because they are inversely proportional to the elephantization of the instruments, the means, punishments keep developing in import and impact, from laborious parking to paralysis of flow, for instance. In the biological context, the punishments are apparent in a body that has trespassed beyond the reasonable limits of its own containment envelope. In the urban context, the punishments are ripened by gigantism, where a polarization in horizontal directions is developed, an ineffectual direction rejected by all manifestation of the animal kingdom. This is the flat city, a poor giant, a poor flattened giant, the most absurd of any conceivable structure whose purpose is to sustain the development of a transvegetal, conscious, willful, acculturating, and personalizing life. It is therefore not just probable but fatal that no interconnecting modes of flow, be they personal or collective, will give results that might warrant the investment they require. The only answer, if the giant is kept as a mystical body, is to renounce in massive terms most of our direct interpersonal and interinstitutional contacts and give ourselves to more and more remote linkages. This is a decision in that making, and it is a momentous decision. Somewhere in the, its future, the flesh will be discarded in favor of non-physiological structures. What of the soul when the flesh is dead? Move data and ideograms instead of moving matter, flesh included. It sounds good, and for many sides of life it's the right path. But for the full development of a sentient, compassionate species, it might demonstrate itself, and too late, as utterly deficient in depth and substance. And then, on a less intangible plane, what about a meal by teletype, a swim by letter, an orgasm by phone, etc.? Or is it a Vietnam by autovisual? Ten years of it. The flesh, to life's advantage, resists abstraction. Even if all the events which do not necessitate the transference of matter were to occur remotely, and even if we were to accept the knot of total electronic desensitization, the bulk of the logistical problem would remain unaffected, especially if we keep in mind that we are already massively dependent on the telephone, telegraph, mail, radio, TV, and a fairly good network of energy, transportation, electricity, gas, etc. The options are fairly restricted, if not desperate. They play into the hands of the worst enemies of civilization, desensitization and segregation. The effects, as we all know, do not stop at physical disruption. They impinge upon the delicate inner world of the psyche and intellectual action. They brutalize psychosomatic man indiscriminately, independent of place, time, caste, blood, religion, or economic status. One effect of this brutalization is that the actor loses the capacity to understanding that he or she is the victim of a condition that would otherwise be unacceptable. 
The victimizer achieves the ultimate in victimization, render the victim dumb to his own mistreatment. If one has not had the experience of diverse situations, one cannot truly conceive of other possibilities. It is easy to see how hopeless the situation becomes for those persons born and raised under such a bad star. In a society where learning is overwhelmingly consigned to symbol systems, from the written word to the electronic message, at the expense of the first-hand experience which environmental perception and direct contact offer, a very legitimate question comes up. Do we need our bodies? Do we need our bodies because they are both an instrument for consciousness and a source of true emotion and joy? Or are we enslaved to a flesh we might not better get rid of, since it is a hindrance to the marvelous computer-like brain for which direct electrical impulses are far more clear and superior than the painstaking journey of information through those conveyors and transformers we call our senses? The question is neither idle nor far-fetched. In the long run and in view of scientific coherence, the idea of moving information instead of moving mass demands that the linkage between event and brain be more direct, hence the intrusive nature of the organs of perception and the desirability of bypass, then... If the body ceases to be more than just a support system for the brain, let's get a better one. There are all conditions or situations where the disposal of the body is temporarily achieved and they are not peculiar to our technological society. The student sealed off from the outdoors by a windowless glass intent on learning about nature. The absent-minded professor, mathematician, or logician, absorbed in their work, carry their bodies around as impediments. In the holy man, a kind of holy man at least, the body is not only ignored but chastised, punished. Because it is the impediment limiting one's own deliverance into God, that pure spirit which the information technician finds in the noiseless vacuum of the electronic yes-no switchboard of the ideal brain, the fleshless supercomputer of future times. If it is assumed that humankind has given on the leash of gravity to a world which is preponderantly two-dimensional, in understanding the delusory character of both modes of transportation, Single carrier or multiple carrier mass transit systems, that is to say, given the grid of the American town, which is assumed to be an asset, and since the inescapable sin is the inescapable gigantism, the pathological dysfunction of any flat system, then it is axiomatic that the technology of information will eventually find it necessary to dismantle man, the flesh and mind animal, to recompose him into an efficient machine of will." Will the desires of such a machine have a superior capacity for creation? Or will its desires, its longings, be bent toward the utter tranquility of a dead universe? Would a willful automobile keep running, or would the unremitting pressure of entropy, bearing on each of its particles, molecular, atomic, and subatomic, have the upper hand, upper steel claw, and leave the automobile preempted of will, preempted by the statistical fate, unwill of statistical machinery? That is to say, does a purely electronic conscious stand for a trans-conscious? Or does such electronic conscious stand for the intrusion in the most fiendish way of determinism into the world of consciousness, so painfully developed by the escalation of sensitization? Does not the flat city stand squarely as one of the moorings for the development of such electronic consciousness? In this reasoning faulty because it is intrinsically incoherent or irrational, or because it is an extreme through logical extrapolation of a trend. I think only the second objection is worth considering. Or is it? Even the most momentous transformations are, for the better part of their development, hidden among the numerous components of routines, which vary only slightly from day to day. The advent of language is a good instance. From grunts and squeaks to a Sophocles tragedy is a lengthy, if unarrestable, progression of enrichment, discrimination, definition, and metamorphosis in both physiological and psychological terms. To stay closer to the subject, it would be hard to pinpoint a day, a year, or even a decade which marks the transformation of a physically pedestrian species into a substantially rubber wheel species, the West. The transformation has been gradual, unpredictable, undetectable. If one were to take a few samples separated by a few days or a few months, all of that notwithstanding, the carless society of 60 or so years ago has become the car-dependent society of today. The impact has been, and even the car mystics would agree, cataclysmic. What I am proposing here is that this momentous transformation in two to three generations' time was nothing less than a first but critical step in the direction of isolation, segregation of the individual, 
whose reconnection with the world has to be via remote abstract communication devices. Quite a nemesis for man via the automobile, that invention, whose original aim had been the opening up of the world to everyone. For an individual as sketched above, the flesh becomes a hindrance in due time, since only a gross technology, a reactionary technology, could accept the ineffective communication of events, no events, via the TV tube organ of sight-brain-metal processing. Technology will bypass both TV tube and its technology, and eyesight and its biotechnology, to plunge its sharpening probes into the convolutions of the brain, in the righteous assumption that very soon that blob of flesh will be archived in the museums of anthropology with the rest... In the remains of the human body. Since the getting there machine, the automobile cannot get me there reasonably, since the bus or the subway can do only a slightly better job, that is, can get a selection of me through a selection of routes to a selection of places in a selected time slot, then I turn to the electron, the mini bulk, mass transit representative of me, and I make it into my informer and messenger. But wait one moment. Am I not a bundle of electrons myself, anyhow? Then wait, wait. Let's rearrange my electronic patrimony into a more efficient system. There. What? The baby is crying. That won't do. A deficiency to be corrected. The couple. What? The couple is dancing. The will of a whim. A man to man. What? The lady is aging. Forget it. The lady is eternal. The cyborg lady is eternal. What? Eternally whimpering? How nostalgic. How stupid. There, there, smile, smile, damn you, damn lady, damn bunch of worlds, the hell with you. There, there, look, there is a father. Get to it, get with it. Father, father, my god, father is my god, and my god, my god is dust. An immense whirl of dust among infinite worlds of dust. Blood, blood be my god. Somewhere let, somewhere there must be blood, a drop of it, a drop of god. Let's begin all over again. I revere thee, therefore I must transfigure thee. Evolution begins again. Can it? Thus concludes Book Three Space and Man Mass Transit Mass Delusion Section four ten of the Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. Tomorrow we will continue continue with section four eleven. Book four Relative Poverty and Frugality. I will see you then. Alam.